Welcome everyone to this special webinar event, Best Practices in Rigid Bronchoscopy, sponsored by AMBU. Before we begin the webinar, just a few reminders to anyone new to the SAB webinars. You all have currently joined in a listen-only mode and are muted. You may ask questions throughout the lecture by using your question feature. It's located on your control panel. We will address all the questions at the end during the Q&A portion. Thank you again to AMBU for being SAB 2023 sponsors. And tonight's speakers will be Dr. Schaller and Dr. Chang, and I will hand it off to them to get us started. Hey, uh, I'm Brian Schaller. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at Stanford University. I'm June Chang, also an interventional pulmonologist at Stanford University Hospital. And we will share our screen. Oh, yeah. All right. Assuming that everyone can see, can I make this smaller? Should we just, okay. I think you just got to drag it to the side. All right. I'm going to get started here. Um, like we said, this talk is going to be uh, titled Best Practices in Rigid Bronchoscopy. I'll talk for the first portion and then I'm going to talk over to Dr. Schaller. So, disclosure as you know, talk about this talk is sponsored by AMBU and for Dr. Schaller specifically. He um, is IP, on IP advisor, board and consultant for AMBU. Uh, objectives today, so number one, we're going to consider indications and contraindications for rigid bronchoscopy. Number two, we're going to discuss anesthesia and ventilation use for rigid bronchoscopy. And number three, we're going to review interventions performed with rigid bronchoscopy. And then number four, highlight benefits of rigid bronchoscopy through various cases. So when we talk bronchoscopy, a lot of the talks kind of open up talking about the very first, you know, in quote bronchoscopy that's performed. And, you know, this is a picture of Gustav Killian, who's considered the father of bronchoscopy using the esophagus go back then to kind of here demonstrating through the um, cadaver what, you know, he has done to mostly at first to first um, do, do foreign body extraction from through the esophagus and all, you know, trachea. So this was considered sort of the first time, not this picture exactly, but he was the first one that this was done, uh, first bronchoscopy performed. And then, and you know, in the U.S., so Dr. Killing was from Germany, in the U.S., around the similar time, a little bit after in the early 1900s, again, was the, what was considered, you know, um, first bronchoscopy in, in the United States through the similar device here on the right side. So, it's the, the barrel itself is facing bottom here, but similar idea with a light source at the top. Um, and, and, you know, the indications for the first sort of bronchoscopy, in this case, obviously, as you can see, the rigid barrel here, um, it was really for extracting foreign bodies that um, people accidentally or knowingly aspirated through the, um, in the esophagus or in the trachea. And then that's, that was where the bronchoscopy came from. So a lot has changed, obviously, since the late 1800s and early 1900s in terms of the equipment itself. So bronchoscope, uh, rigid bronchoscope is now made from various parts in terms of to assemble one and in terms of what they're labeled as. So we have this barrel, which is the long part of the rigid bronchoscope. We have this device that are different pieces of the connector that is attached to the barrel um, where we introduce different tools. And then we also have here in this picture at the bottom shows the, the middle part here on the left side shows the rigid barrel with the connector assembled. And then the bottom here is the rigid telescope. So the camera device that, um, that attaches to. Um, this is the, the camera that is attached to our uh, monitors. And then this uh, green coil here is the, the, an example of a light, uh, light source here that's connected to the obvious light source that comes in. And then the plastic catheter appears an example of a uh, rigid suction catheter that could be introduced through the rigid barrel that helps during the procedure. So all assembled together, as I said, this is the rigid barrel on the left side here that gets connected to the connector piece in the middle with the example of a rigid suction that gets introduced in through one of the rigid channels on the, at the top here. Um, and then the rigid telescope is already uh, introduced through the, the back part of the rigid barrel. Uh, important thing that I want to mention here is that there are the silicone caps that are holding the rigid camera and the um, rigid suction in place. And then you see the um, rigid um, camera in the back here, as well as a light source. And just an example of sort of how typically one would hold a rigid bronchoscope with one hand. 
Um, in addition to the, the tool in terms of rigid suction, there are also various um, other tools that we use that Dr. Shell will talk also more in the future, but some of the simpler tools that we use that's developed a while back also are rigid forceps, so they are forceps tip um, here, and then these are the different types of tools that we would use to uh, load up the, the stent that we may deploy, and then to deploy the stent um, after loading up to these barrels, and these um, will be introduced through the back part of the rigid barrel. So, in terms of the intubation with, uh, with rigid bronchoscope, so here's a video of a rigid intubation. Kind of hard to appreciate because we have to blur the patient's uh, face, but you can see the rigid um, bronchoscope entered in sort of at the right angle first, going down inside the patient's mouth here. And then, you know, uh, the operator here is holding rigid with his left hand, so he's holding it with the left hand at uh, the back part with the connector. And then with the right hand is um, giving the fulcrum to the rigid where it's entering uh, inside the patient's mouth. And then here, um, you see the side port of the rigid where it gets connected to the ventilator tubing, and then the back part is briefly open. We won't see it here, but the flexible bronchoscope actually is going to go in through this barrel uh, pretty shortly. And then just to show it in the diagram here, so at the end of it, or right before it goes through the cords, well, the way that patient's positioned, ideally you would have a straight view of the um, a retinoids and vocal cords here, and then the tip of the rigid bronch barrel um, lifting up the epiglottis. So that in a video view of the camera going in, so that's the hard palate up here at the bottom part, and then you will see the tongue uh, at the, the bottom, and you won't see it, but and then you're gonna, you saw, saw the uvula, we're in the midline, and you see the epiglottis at the very tip of the rigid barrel here, and the operator here, we're trying to, get under the epiglottis to op uh, to lift it up and now we're going to see the vocal cords here and you turn the rigid barrel sideways to make sure that we're not damaging the cords and then we'll enter through the, the cords here to enter the um, subglottic space and the, the trachea and you see the barrel kind of driving down here now in terms of anesthesia considerations uh, prior to rigid bronchoscope it's very similar to when we're considering just regular intubation, given that one could think that rigid bronchoscope in a way is just a gigantic metal um, uh, barrel tube that you're using for intubation. Um, so similar um, assessment in terms of patients, teeth, denture, mouth opening, mouth and potty score, uh, thyroid mental distance, neck mobility. Um, these are mostly to let the operator kind of know what to anticipate in terms of how anterior the, the um, glottis is, for example. Um, also, when we talk about sedation for rigid bronchoscope, so as you guys saw, the barrel, the size of the barrel um, at the largest that we use here goes up to about 14 millimeters in diameter, just in comparison to, let's say, a ADO endotracheal tube, which um, the outer diameter of that would be closer to 11 millimeters. So we want to make sure that patient is well sedated before we stimulate the, the upper airway as well as inside the airway. So at minimum, we want um, total intravenous anesthesia, general anesthesia with deep sedation. Oftentimes, in most cases at our institution, we will ask for a neuromuscular blockade to make sure that patient is not moving or coughing because you could imagine there could be a lot of damage to the upper airway or you know mouth um, teeth if patients coughing or moving with the, the rigid barrel on that it was in place. And even though the, in a closed circuit ventilation, we will use um, uh, mouth packing and uh, uh, silicone caps to create the cl uh, closed ventilation, we avoid volatile gas given the, the um, risk for leak around the um, rigid barrel. Um, this is pretty obvious, but in terms of um, <laughs> the team members that are performing rigid bronchos bronchoscopy in the OR, um, we will have the, the, the bronchos bronchoscopist that's performing the procedure, we'll have the anesthesiologist um, and the trained respiratory therapist and OR nurse who will be at minimum to um, assist uh, the procedure, and again, I think this is pretty given for any kind of procedure or surgery or anything, but 
uh, especially for rigid bronchoscopy uh, compared to the, the regularly performed flexible bronchoscope bronchoscopy. It's essential for team members to communicate prior to entering the case. Um, I, I think especially between the a procedural list and the anesthesiologist, given that we're sharing the airway and, you know, given that, you know, there could be, uh, uh, for, because of the various indications for rigid bronchoscope, most patients are not the healthiest coming in. So we want to make sure we have a good backup plan. Uh, ventilation during rigid bronch bronchoscopy. So there is conventional ventilation, which is very similar to um, any kind of other, you know, during surgery or uh, uh, general anesthesia, TIVA, flexible bronchoscopy. So uh, closed circuit system, like uh, when patient has an endotracheal tube in, um, patient will get intubated with their rigid bronchoscope, and then we we're going to try to create closed systems. So patient's mouth is packed with gauze um, so that there's no leak around and coming, uh, there's no leaked airway coming out. And then we use silicone caps that we, um, that I showed you earlier in the pictures to make sure that there are no holes at the proximal part of the rigid bronchoscope. And then uh, to the conventional ventilator, uh, we just connect the, the uh, side port uh, with the tubing so that the ventilator can pick up all the, the end title as well as um, can deliver all the, the gas and everything else too. The one advantage of conventional ventilation over um, the other ventilation that I'm gonna talk about in a second, Jeff ventilation, is that um, anesthesiologists who want to monitor end title and wanna give positive pressure breath, um, that you know, similar to again, to conventional ventilation that we use endotracheal tube, those could be done. Now, the other mode of ventilation is jet ventilation. So um, this um, allows for open circuit where we, um, instead of the conventional ventilator, um, this, is a, this picture is an example of a jet ventilator that we use a specialized machine that is delivering laminar flow um, air oxygen through the uh, ventilator tube, through the um, rigid bronchoscope so that the, the oxygen is delivered to the distal part or to the alveoli and bypassing all the stuff. Now, the important part here is that it allows for open circuit, and the open circuit itself is very important because you need all the gas to kind of escape through it. Uh, so it is one way that, um, that we could ventilate patients during rigid bronchos bronchoscopy. The advantage of this besides having the open circuit is that um, well, the open circuit itself allows one to be able to put in uh, various tools through without having the silicone cap around. So you may have slightly larger working um, channel for, with all the tools. Um, the, the challenging part is that if patients have underlying parenchymal lung disease or obstructive lung disease, then it may be difficult to ventilate and have the FIO2, the oxygen level up throughout the procedure. Um, contraindications to rigid bronchoscopy. There are very few absolute contraindications. Like I mentioned before, um, for the prior to rigid uh, bronchoscopy, we want to assess patient's neck mobility. And one of the reasons is that we prefer to have a straight line view to the uh, glottis or vocal cords. And to do that, we often expose patient's neck. Kind of, you can see it on this creepy looking model here. Um, so you want to have the, the neck hyperextended, but if patients have um, C-spine issues or neck mobility issues, um, then that will be challenging. Also, if they have um, facial malformations or having any significant obstruction, even prior to us getting to the vocal cords, then we won't be able to safely insert the rigid barrel. Uh, talking about indications for um, rigid broncos bronchoscopy, so like I mentioned, the way and how it first got developed, foreign body aspiration is one of the indications for rigid bronchoscopy. These you know, various materials that patients have aspirated could be uh, retrieved using rigid bronchoscopy. The, I think, big caveat, as a lot of the audience might notice, though, is that you know, since the development of flexible bronchoscopy and with all the tools that we have, including the forceps, baskets, and everything else, oftentimes the, a lot of the objects could nowadays be just retrieved with uh, flexible bronchoscope only. Uh, in fact, the, all the pictures that I've showed you, which are the different form bodies that myself or Dr. Schaller uh, have retrieved throughout our fellowship or our training, 
um, these are all actually retrieved by flex over on Cusco without using rigid. But I'm telling you that um, if it was a larger objective, for example, but one of the indications for a foreign body aspiration um, or to retrieve the foreign bodies would be rigid bronchoscope. Um, the other indication that we've been taught uh, or have always been listed as massive hemoptysis, uh, reason being that you, one could use a rigid bronchoscope to uh, intubate the main stem bronchus to isolate the side, side from bleeding. Also, these, um, this is a, the barrel end, and you can see the side ports here that would allow, if this tube were to be in a main stem, the side ports uh, would allow uh, ventilation to the contralateral lung while we're dealing with the bleeding or you know, trying to tampon out or come up with the next plant. And the rigid bronchoscope itself could be uh, uh, a tool that's uh, doing the, the direct tampon out to bleeding tissue. Again, caveat here is that if a patient is having massive, a massive hemoptysis event in front of me, unless I have the rigid bronchoscope in the patient's mouth or have it right next to me set up already, it would take too long probably to set this up and more likely than not, you'll have flexible bronchoscopy that's available. So I think to say that the first indication to deal with massive hemoptysis with the rigid bronchoscope is a little bit of a stretch, but it does work great when we are doing a case with rigid uh, bronchoscope or when we're anticipating a possible massive hemoptysis or bleeding um, from, let's say, for example, tumor debulking, then it's a great tool to have when we're doing the procedure. Um, lastly, this is a pretty big category that Dr. Scheller will go more into, but we talk about um, uh, central air obstruction and how to deal with it. So um, largely we could divide a therapeutic bronchoscopy into uh, dealing with you know, malignant airway disease and benign airway disease. And for rigid bronchoscopy, we're mainly mostly talking about central airway obstruction. So um, here are basically the list that Dr. Scheller is going to go into. Again, we there are a bunch of other tools that that we could integrate with rigid bronchoscope to to deal with a um, bunch of issues for both benign and malignant disease. Um, and then I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Scheller. Hello. Um, so you know, I, I I think to you know one of the one of the questions that I think about and 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 Dr. Chang thinks about when when we're considering whether a patient should have an intervention done by a rigid bronchoscopy or other means. Um, a big question that, that, that we ask ourselves, and I think a question that everyone in this room probably asks from time to time and, and, and is, I think, a challenge to answer. And there's no you know, direct line you can draw straight down to divide these two categories, but can it be done with rigid, without rigid bronchoscopy? So many interventions can be done with a flexible bronchoscope alone, um, but I think there are a few considerations uh, when deciding whether to perform an intervention by a flexible bronchoscopy or rigid bronchoscopy alone. And, and I think that referring to rigid bronchoscopy as a therapeutic modality in and of itself is often a misnomer. It's in many ways, as Dr. Chang said, a conduit. It's a large endotracheal tube, um, and, and it's a, a, a means of, of, of uh, enacting various other interventions, um, although there are some interventions that are strictly limited to rigid bronchoscopy. Um, so when we think about a case and we think about what direction we're, we're, we're going to go, um, we think about the fact that some cases are better suited to rigid bronchoscopy. And, and, and I'll share some cases that um, I think are illustrative of, of this point in one way or another. Um, some procedures are safer with rigid bronchoscopy. Um, so as Dr. Chang mentioned, if you're anticipating a lot of bleeding or you're anticipating uh, potential complications of, 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 of central airway obstruction, the need to bypass a central obstruction and quickly uh, restore ventilation. Um, and some interventions are only possible with rigid bronchoscopy. So our, our tools that we use um, as they get miniaturized further and further and they fit down uh, increasingly smaller working channels, um, the distinction there is, is blurred. Um, but there are still some tools and certainly some interventions, for example, silicone stenting um, that really cannot be performed um, without a rigid bronchoscope. And there is a case report of people placing a silicone stent through a tracheostomy. Um, and so this is something that certainly can be done, but I think is done um, not without considerable effort and, and certainly not uh, standard practice. Um, but really cool that someone did that. Um, 
So uh, in, in thinking about, you know, about this question, uh, we consider, you know, appropriate case selection for rigid bronchoscopy. So, you know, uh, what are the reasons whether to intervene with rigid bronchoscopy or flexible bronchoscopy alone? One is anatomy. So is the lesion in a location for a rigid scope to be beneficial? And conversely, is the lesion too distal for a rigid scope to be helpful? If you're dealing with something in, in the trachea or the, the main stem bronchi or some of the lobar airways, rigid bronchoscopy can be really helpful. Conversely, if you're dealing with something in you know, the left lower lobe or, or you know, the right middle lobe somewhere or the right upper lobe somewhere where your rigid bronchoscope really can't access um, and when you're maybe unlikely to use other interventions that are only compatible with rigid bronchoscopy, there might not be much, much utility starting off with a rigid scope. Um, pathology and pathophysiology uh, considerations are, are taken into account as well. So um, might I use tools or techniques that are best or exclusively suited to a rigid scope? And again, the converse of this is, you know, would I perform the case in entirely the same way without a rigid scope? And, and if you can really think to yourself, you know, that, that you might not use anything special or unique or different with a rigid scope versus a flex scope alone, well, that case might be no better performed with rigid bronchoscopy than without. Um, and then lastly, and really maybe this should go first, um, and I didn't put it first because bronchoscopy in general is, is relatively safe, has a good safety profile, I should say. Um, could using a rigid scope help mitigate potential risks? Um, this is, I think, a little subjective and a little qualitative and a little hard to drill down on, but um, for, for people who become more accustomed and more experienced with rigid bronchoscopy, there is a certain level of control and stability in the central airways that it provides. Um, and this can help, especially in really gnarly high-grade central airway obstructions, where if you have the, the, the training or the tools or the skills to bypass a large central airway obstruction quickly, you may feel safer and, and better able to uh, ensure the safety of the patient if you're doing the case with a rigid bronchoscope than, say, perhaps with your flex tools. Um, and of course, the converse of this, you know, are the potential complications managed equally well without a rigid scope. Um, and, and if you can really, you know, satisfy all of these, you know, secondary, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, questions, then that's a case that might not need to go for rigid bronchoscopy. But if you think that, you know, the anatomy, the pathophysiology and the safety could all be, uh, you know, best managed or optimized with rigid bronchoscopy, then that might be a case that you opt to do a rigid bronchoscopy upfront. Um, and the last thing I'll say before we talk about uh, some particular indications and, and, and uh, situations where rigid bronchoscopy is indicated, this is not something that you can just draw a fine line dividing the two. There are lots and lots of people who are doing what I might do with a rigid bronchoscope exclusively with flexible bronchoscopy. Um, and, and some of that is, is, is training and people's comfort, it's experience, and it's the availability of resources. Um, are there some cases that I would absolutely not do with just one or just the other? Yes. Um, but, but it doesn't mean that there has to be, you know, a hard line drawn in the sand for doing something one way or the other. Um, we just sort of hope to talk about uh, some indications in some cases where, where you really probably aren't better off uh, using rigid bronchoscopy as your means uh, to, to provide an intervention. Um, so uh, to wrap up our talk, so this, you know, sort of the, the last third, we'll, we'll talk about some common indications and illustrative cases. Um, uh, so, so I'm sort of framing this around the concept of reopening the airway because I think the majority of rigid bronchoscopy cases that we do, or at least where we start out with the intention of doing rigid bronchoscopy, are in cases where we're dealing with central airway obstruction. Um, and a lot of you have probably seen this, these diagrams before, but when we think about airway obstruction, we think about different kinds of tumor obstructions, whether benign or malignant, um, from endoluminal, so just confined to the airway. If you removed it, you would otherwise have a relatively normal airway mixed obstruction where you have disease in the airway causing blockage and disease on the outside pushing in and causing narrowing. And then thirdly, uh, extra luminal obstruction where there's really no evidence of, of a lesion in the airway, but there's something outside pressing in. And then lastly, dynamic obstruction. So these are your TBMs, your EDACs. Um, and I arrange them in this order because as you move from the left side to the right side, you have this continuum where um, you know, all the way on the left, debulking is a big part of your intervention. And with pure endoluminal obstruction, debulking might really be all that you need. And then as you get to mixed extraluminal and dynamic obstruction, you start thinking about, um, you know, the potential utility of, of, of devices or, or stents to help maintain patency of the airway. Um, debulking and recanalization really is just removing tissue within the airway to alleviate an obstruction. 
Um, and as we saw in the previous slide, this is suitable for patients with intrinsic or purely endoluminal obstruction or mixed obstruction, um, can be used for both malignant and benign disease. Um, and certain strictures in stenoses um, can benefit from these techniques as well. Um, some, you know, via flexible bronchoscopy alone, some with rigid bronchoscopy, especially where we're talking about complex lesions that may require uh, stenting. Um, and there are lots of different therapeutic modalities um, that we use. Um, so this is a list short of stenting. You have lots of hot therapies that June talked about, uh, cautery probes and forceps, snares, APC, lasers, uh, cold uh, therapeutics, cryoprobes, for example, and then all of our mechanical tools. So forceps, microdebrider, using a balloon for dilation, and the rigid bronchoscope itself for uh, debulking and coring out lesions. Um, so when we're specifically talking about debulking tissue from the airway, um, why would one use rigid bronchoscopy? Well, one reason is the need for rapid recanalization. Patients, for example, with high-grade tracheal obstructions where you need to get in fast and alleviate obstruction and restore ventilation, um, or patients who have lesions that are, are, are so serious or so firm or so obstructive or so distal that you might not be able to bypass them with an ET tube alone. Um, rigid bronchoscope uh, is a big conduit and allows for a um, high degree of ease in swapping out tools or using multiple tools at once. For example, when we're placing st silicone stents, sometimes you might wanna have forceps and your flexible scope added radial dilation balloon in the airway as you seat that Y stent in place. Um, or you might wanna have a cryoprobe and APC or cryoprobe and a balloon in case there's bleeding. Um, some tools are not readily compatible with flexible scope. Um, this is, you know, this category is dwindling over time. Um, but silicone stents are one example of, of something that's really not adaptable to, to non-rigid bronchoscopy. Um, and uh, another thing that we've talked about is, you know, anticipating and managing complications that very qualitative, very subjective um, uh, um, appreciation of stability and control um, that, that sometimes uh, 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 conferred with rigid bronchoscopy. Um, and then lastly, the possibility of stenting. And, and, and in a few slides, we'll talk about you know, stenting that absolutely can be done with a flexible scope alone, but um, larger stents and certainly silicone stents are, are, are sort of predicated on the ability to use rigid bronchoscopy. Um, so moving on to stents, um, and I did not change this, that's embarrassing. Well, stents are not used to remove tissue within the airway unless you use them incorrectly. Um, stents are used to alleviate obstruction by restoring airway patency. Um, they're suitable for a variety of different indications, patients with extrinsic, um, or mixed obstruction, patients with dynamic or malasic disease, um, patients with holes in the airways, defects, dehiscences, fistulas. Um, we have a big lung transplant population here, so we see our fair number of, of airway dehiscences um, at, that require sometimes require stenting to seal off a defect. Um, and there are various stent options in terms of material, sizes, shapes, configurations. Here's a picture with a whole bunch of different kinds of stents, some old, some new, some no longer available. Um, and stents may be unmodifiable. So usually you know, we consider most of our metal stents is unmodifiable. You can't cut them. You can't poke holes in all of them, although some you can. Um, modifiable stents, which are the stents that you can cut and drill and poke holes in your silicone stents. And then lastly, patient-specific stents, so stents that you can actually order that are modeled based on an airways, uh, patient's airway CT. Um, so, you know, why use rigid bronchoscopy? Uh, well, I don't know why that slide is in there. Sorry. Well, okay. We'll go and we'll talk about some cases. Um, that's what happens when you make last minute changes to a PowerPoint. Um, so here are some cases that I think illustrate um, the benefits of using rigid bronchoscopy for this general category of reopening the airway, whether it's debulking and recanalization, placement of a stent, or a combination. Um, this is a, a relatively young gentleman with squamous cell carcinoma. He had been diagnosed previously and, and had a CT scan a, a couple of weeks before he got transferred here, um, showing this very high grade tracheal obstruction. Um, and, and I think, unsurprisingly, he was developing progressively worsening dyspnea and strider such that when he arrived, he was in the ICU, not intubated, but tripoding, diaphoretic on heliox. Um, and, and as we see here, the severe tracheal obstruction. So um, because it was felt that he would not be successfully intubated with an endotracheal tube and probably not a great patient to place an LMA in, um, we decided to go direct to rigid bronchoscopy. And we actually found this sort of surprising mixed lesion with you know, areas that where you can see there's extrinsic narrowing, the airway wall is pushing in, followed by this bulky uh, obstructive tumor in the airway. Um, so with the rigid scope, we were able to get past that obstruction very quickly. He 
was a you know gentleman with poor reserves and and desaturated very quickly and and you know fortunately with the rigid scope we were able to advance to the main carina stabilize his breathing stabilize his ventilation and then back up and do some more meticulous cleanup of the tumor using a snare using cryoprobe and then ultimately placed a stent to alleviate the airway obstruction um, so thinking back at a case like this, you know, how does a patient like this benefit from rigid bronchoscopy? I would say a few things. Quick stabilization of the airway, the ability to rapidly bypass the lesion, restore ventilation, and then rapidly debulk a tumor. And then lastly, definitive management with placement of a stent. Um, another case, sort of a similar sad situation. Um, this was an older woman with a rapidly expanding, very, very firm neck mass. Um, she was admitted, she underwent a biopsy that confirmed anaplastic thyroid cancer, and because of the lesion, she was deemed unsuitable for tracheostomy, and, and the prior conversation had been, you know, going to, going to hospice, basically, but the patient wanted to pursue other interventions, um, and, and because of the firmness of the lesion and the diameter of the airway, it was felt that there would probably be no way to safely, <clears throat> safely intubate her um, with a, you know, flexible endotracheal tube. Um, we did a rigid intubation, which showed a very high grade, completely extrinsic obstruction in the airway, no tumor tissue. Um, but with a rigid scope, we were able to push the mass to the side and advance the main carina and restore ventilation. And then in this situation, we placed a large covered metal stent in the trachea, which we ultimately swapped out for a silicone stent. Um, and the patient had rapid symptomatic improvement and was able to go on and tolerate cancer treatment and, and survive for several months longer. Um, and these are just her, her after pictures of restored patency. Um, so, you know, how does a patient like this benefit from rigid bronchoscopy? Again, I think similar principles. Rapid, rapidly securing the airway to restore ventilation, um, the inability to bypass the obstruction by other means, um, the ability to deploy a stent under direct visualization, um, and the lack of surgical options in this case. Um, these are two cases that I think highlight the, the utility of silicone stenting, which is an intervention that we're really only able to provide currently with flexible, with rigid bronchoscopy. So two different patients with two similar problems. Um, an older gentleman with synovial sarcoma who had a uh, right pneumonectomy that unfortunately was complicated by stump dehiscence, current pleural space infections, and open pleural space. And on the right was a gentleman who... Um, had a had a preliminary diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer and on explant of the of the, the pneumonectomy specimen was actually found to have lymphoma and he too experienced a stump dehiscence and recurrent pleural space infections and actually had a claget window um, when we first saw him. Um, so in these uh, in both of these cases, prior surgical interventions have been tried, prior stenting interventions have been tried. So metal stents have been placed with without much success, without a good seal. Um, and in the case of the gentleman on, uh, actually both cases, but especially the gentleman on the right, um, the size mismatch between the left main stem and the trachea was so great that really nothing fit very well. Something was either oversized in one airway or undersized in the other, um, and in either event, uh, didn't really help with the air leak through the through the open stump. Um, so in the first case, we took a silicone Y stent, cut off the right limb, and modified it, sutured it closed, and put glue in there. Um, you can tell that I did the suturing because it's really sloppy, um, and I'm super bad at this part. Um, and uh, in the other case, we we actually got a, a patient-specific silicone Y stent uh, from the company Visionaire, and they worked with us to um, create a walled-off limb here and leave a little blind stump to uh, anchor in the airway. And, and at this point, we knew that the defect wasn't going to heal, so we were comfortable leaving something in there just to anchor the stent in place. And this basically provided a single conduit, single lumen stent with an angle in it to go from the trachea to the left main stem. So this is the stent deployed in the first patient with the, the sutured limb, and then this is the uh, visionary stent, which seamlessly blends in with the airway. Here's the silicone window to the stump driving up through the stent. Um, and both of these patients experience symptomatic benefit and have not had recurrent pleural space, space infections since, and then this is my fellow giving you an extra little view through the, through the hole. Um, so why do cases like this benefit from rigid bron bronchoscopy? I really think there's just one factor, but it's an important factor, which is that it's required for silicone stent placement. And these are patients in whom other interventions were unsuccessful. Um, so I don't think that we would have been able, at least I wouldn't have been able to manage it by other means. Um, so uh, in, in the last few moments, I wanna talk about stenting without rigid bronchoscopy and then um, present some cautionary cases or, or some cases that um, I think are, are, are reflections for me and, and for my team where we think about how we do things differently. 
um, or how we could do things differently or, or, or do things that are ultimately better for our patients. Um, so tubular metal stents may absolutely be deployed, deployed without rigid bronchoscopy. Um, you can do it through an ET tube under fluoroscopy. Uh, some stents can be deployed by the working channel of a flexible therapeutic flexible scope, and there are even really skilled, dexterous people who will go in and piggyback a, um, a stent alongside a, a, you know, a, a small uh, flexible scope and deploy it in the area under direct, direct visualization. Um, there are some downsides of being limited to metal stents. Metal stents are fantastic, and, and there's a lot of things that they're really excellent for. Um, however, some pathologies, as, as of the data that we have, which is limited, are better managed with silicone stents, and these include things like benign obstruction or malacia. Um, uh, some of this has to do with the fact that these are patients that are expected to survive longer, and they're patients that may have stents in for a longer period of time. Um, metal stents tend to have a shorter lifespan. Um, and the longer they're in place, the more likely you'll have granulation tissue, which you can also have with silicone stents, epithelialization, which you don't really see as much or at all with silicone stents, erosion and fracture, which are less common with silicone stents. Um, metal stents are generally non-customizable. You can't easily trim, suture, or hole punch them. Um, they're harder to remove when problems arise. So going back to the issues of granulation and epithelialization, this can make metal stents very challenging and sometimes not possible to remove. Um, and then lastly, this is very anecdotal, but I, I at least feel from my own experience, and, and I'm, I'm sure there are others who, who have shared this, that it is harder to oversize a silicone stent. Silicone stents are much less forgiving. You can put a large metal stent in a smaller airway and it'll open up partially or mostly, but over time it may expand to its maximum diameter. And, and, and what follow here are a few cases that I think illustrate some of the downsides of not of metal stent placing as a whole practice, but um, of placing metal stents when perhaps other interventions might have been more appropriate. So this was a, a patient who um, had relapsing polychondritis, had severe TBM, and underwent the placement of up to five metal stents um, between 2005 and 2016. And these stents were placed um, by, a flex, by, a, by an endotracheal tube under fluoroscopy um, uh, in, in, in a scenario where there were not proper tools to remove all of them or to remove them when complications developed. And so unfortunately, he wound up in a cycle of having stent upon stent placed to deal with the extension of his malacia and to deal with complications from prior stents. Um, and from 2018 to 2021, he began to develop recurrent episodes of pneumonia and was coughing up filaments of, of metal from these stents. Um, so we took him for multiple rigid bronchoscopies in 2021 to try to extract these stents. And this is a view of his distal trachea with these side-by-side -side, double barrel braid metal stents that are only partially visible because the rest is embedded in airway wall and, and epithelialized. And these are, are the bird's nest tangles of stents that we were able to extract. Um, and after extracting enough and, and clearing up the airway, we were able to order a, a custom stent for him and, and, and deploy that in the airway. And fortunately, he's not now been free from pneumonia for um, nearly a year. Um, so this is another, another case um, of a, uh, um, a young woman who uh, had uh, COVID pneumonia, had um, post-tracheostomy tracheal stenosis, and underwent placement of a, of a covered metal stent um, that was oversized, so 20 millimeters in diameter. Um, and uh, you know, looked great on initial pictures um, that were sent to us, but probably over time expanded. Um, and she developed progressively worsening cough and strider, came in and was seen by our ENT colleagues who, who, who called us to the room to, to help out with the distal airway. They saw stenosis immediately above the stent. So we did a rigid bronchoscopy to remove the stent. Um, and after getting the stent out, um, we saw that the patient develop basically iatrogenic tracheomegaly. So this is a, a view from her upper mid trachea and you can see this very massively dilated um, injured trachea that unfortunately um, didn't heal. And uh, we, I think, sort of I foolhardily tried to put other silicone stents in this, but really there was nothing to fit that very large area. And ultimately the patient required a tracheostomy and a T-tube for, for what may have been a potentially, I think potentially avoidable um, airway injury. Um, so, so to wrap up on those, how could some cases like these have benefited from rigid bronchoscopy earlier? Well, I think in the case of the embedded metal stents, maybe earlier intervention to remove damaged stents with time, possibly with greater ease and less risk. Um, again, this concept of having cues for correct sizing of stenting um, and the lower risk of oversizing with silicone stents. And then lastly, placement of silicone stent at the initial presentation, I think, you know, arguably would have been more appropriate for some of these folks, if not, you know, at least for the, 
patient with metal stents um, where you're anticipating leaving stents in for an extended period of time um, in someone with, with a malasic airway lesion. Um, so to leave you on, on, on sort of that sad note, um, sorry about that. Um, to summarize, rigid bronchoscopy can be used to manage a variety of different malignant and benign central area uh, lesions, including obstructive lesions, major hemorrhage in certain indications, and, and even foreign body removal. Um, and as the doctor, Dr. Chang said, rigid bronchoscopy was really born out of the need for foreign body removal, starting with, with a pork bone now over 100 years ago. And, and you know, we've been moving away from it for foreign body extraction, but it's still, still used for this indication. Um, some contraindications that we see to this procedure are C-spine immobility, anatomy issues, especially oropharyngeal issues that may preclude rigid intubation. Um, uh, various tools, pretty much all tools available for bronchoscopic intervention in general are compatible with rigid bronchoscopy and some are actually only suited to rigid bronchoscopy. Um, as, as Dr. Chang stressed, communication and coordination with your entire team, your anesthesiologist, your respiratory therapist, your nurses, um, are essential for safe and successful procedures. And then lastly, um, I hope we were able to highlight some procedures or indications, especially those involving central airway disease, um, that may be performed perhaps safer and more effectively um, with the addition of rigid bronchoscopy. Um, this is our team at Stanford. We have a, 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 a team that's pretty big and growing. Um, that was Eric doing the rigid intubation. Um, he did a nice job. Um, these are all of our, our, our really incredible respiratory therapists um, and our, our amazing staff of, of office nurses and our, our two APPs, Deanna and Colin, um, who form up our pleural disease service. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and well, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Yes, thank you everyone um, for joining and thank you Drs. Schaller and Chang for a very informative presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions into the chat or into the question feature. It's located on your control panel and we will begin. I opened up the questions, not the chat. There we go. Okay. Uh, so. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so I have a question for Dr. Chang. Um, are there particular kinds of cases that you feel you you have to do with rigid bronchoscopy, like in in your own practice, that you you wouldn't you would opt to refer somewhere else or go down another strategy if you didn't have those tools available to you? I think, in, to sort of highlight the point that you made in terms of how do I decide the, to use the rigid Bron bronchoscope the like you mentioned there are some black and I think there are some black and white answers still in terms of like hey you know is this a silicone stent Y stent that I need to do with rigid or even in consideration then I think it's better for you know to for the time sake as well as a patient safety standpoint to do rigid bronchos bronchoscopy to begin with um, I think it's a little bit more gray in terms of when we start talking about um, things that are that one that other patient or other providers may think that hey it could be done through the flexible bronchoscopy so for example we start talking about tumor debulking um whether it's in the trachea or you know in the right left main stem you know it, in terms of talking about and in terms of dealing with them then you start thinking about how much bleeding am i anticipating how much um how much tumor am I going to debulk out? And you know, again, for that, for the safety of the patient, and then um, for the the amount of time that you're going to spend doing it, it, in my opinion, I think it may be better to if the center or like in our case, we're lucky that we have good capability of starting out with, with rigid. So I think it's safer to do that. So I think. It, and giving kind of a vague answer in that, I think each case is obviously very different, but besides the obvious fleck and white of, hey, we need rigid barrel as a big conduit, I think better thing to th think about is what is better for the patient safety, and then also realistically, what is the most efficient way of getting the case done um, uh, for the for the case, uh, for the patient, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I... yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I think we're, we're a very similar mind on, on that, and, and I, I... I, I think one of the things that you you know you mentioned of, of uh, you know giving this this sense of of starting with the rigid if you anticipate needing it and I think I think that brings up a good point of sort of you know if you have something at your disposal and you think you might use it 
and you use it, you're always going to have situations where you didn't need it. Um, it once you, you know, one of the big, I think, hurdles for us was getting staff and, you know, all, 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 all people involved on board with the process and comfortable with the process um, and, and, and sort of dispelling ideas about Richard Bronkoscopy being scary or higher risk or meaning that the patient was higher risk. But, you know, just like with intubation, if you're, if you're not reintubating some people, you're probably not extubating enough of them. If you have, you know, you're going to be doing more rigid bronchoscopies, then if, if you have it available, you're going to be doing something you don't need to do. Um, and, and there's definitely cases where that we've both done where we get in there and we realize we could have done it with flex, but, but I, I, I agree with all the points you made. I think those are kind of the things I think about as well. Um, we have two questions that came, we have a few questions that came in. So the first question is, can you discuss alternatives to jet ventilation for rigid bronchoscopy? Yeah, I think, sorry, I, I was not clear in terms of the slide uh, describing. So I listed conventional ventilation versus jet ventilation. So if uh, the alternative ventilation strategy would be um, essentially having, think of the rigid bronchoscope as the large barrel uh, instead of your endotracheal tube, and then one can connect the, the side port of the rigid barrel directly into a tube that is connected to your conventional ventilator. Now, again, the emphasis is that similar to when a patient is um, intubated with endotracheal tube, you inflate the balloon to create that seal. You want to create a closed circuit with a rigid bronchoscope. Therefore, having, for example, the um, gauze to pack the mouth as well as the silicone caps to make sure that all your working channels are sealed off. Um, that would, so that again is the only alternative strategy is that going back to the, what we would typically call conventional ventilator, or ventilation strategy would be. So uh, I'm, I'm not aware, I'm, I'm sure there are different machines available for jet ventilation, but when we're discussing sort of the overall strategy for ventilation, besides jet ventilation, the only other strategy would be conventional ventilation with closed circuit system. Um, we have another question. So, um, uh, so um, do you think most places will have difficulty having case numbers to justify rigid programs? Um, the question actually brings up that you know, with with larger flexible scopes, um, that rigids are needed less and less. Um, so, what volume of cases is the maximum, the minimum number to maintain a program? That's a really good question. So, in terms of maintaining a training program, uh, those those numbers are set, and I believe they're currently set at 50. That um, the, the required number of rigid cases for a fellow to graduate from from an, an IP an accredited IP fellowship is 50. Um, I uh, Dr. Chang and I both went to programs that I think had a had a, um, a, a probably on the higher side of, of rigid volume um, and and I think you know whether we're right or wrong I think we both sort of are lean in that direction of 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 wanting you know our our fellow to get a lot of rigid experience. Um, uh, I, I, it's really hard to say. I think that you know, for for the individual provider, um, I think training numbers of at least 50, um, at least 50, are 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 needed to, you know, probably feel comfortable going out and 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 doing cases afterwards, doing cases on your own. But it also, you know, I think it matters what it is. Um, it doesn't, you know, it it. It, it, it might take a lot less than, you know, probably will take a lot less than 50 intubations to get comfortable with intubation. Um, getting comfortable with silicone stents, you know, or, or other interventions is, you know, everything that you're adding to it is something different. And so I think it's a very, that's a very challenging question to answer. I think it depends on the frequency of your cases, how, how they're batched together, um, whether you have a trainee who's sharing in that volume or it's you by yourself, um, and what interventions you expect to be doing. Um, I, I know it's kind of a non-answer, but it's a it's a it's a very it's a thought-provoking question, a challenging question. Um, we have a, another question, which is um, in the case of bleeding, when you use coagulation, uh, what is the max power that we can use? Um, it depends on what you're using. So you know, um, I, I I think June and I both tend to go for APC for for you know bleeding and mucosal bleeding in the airway. Um, I think our mission to like 26, the like preset is like 26 watts and 0.8 liters per minute of, of argon flow. Um, you know, I, 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 there's a range there. Some people go lower, some people go higher. You probably don't need more than a liter per minute of flow for our, for APC. Um, the rest, a lot of it depends on what tool you're using. Everything's, you know, going to be a little different, whether it's cautery or laser, um, even how you're measuring your output. 
Um, so I, I don't I don't think there's sort of a one a one size fits all answer to that question, but it's a good question. Um, uh, what anesthesia do we use? Um, do we use uh, muscle relaxant? Yeah, so we we talked we touched it on it briefly in terms of anesthesia. So we at our institution we do prefer to use muscle relaxant with every case again because we want the patient to be at least very very deeply sedated. So um, and knowing that most of the cases that we do are probably under an hour, I would say, and max maybe an hour and a half, unless there are very complicated cases or things that we did not anticipate that happening. So, you know, we we typically ask our anesthesiologist colleagues to give muscle relaxant and knowing also that, you know, they know what to anticipate in terms of the duration of the case, that's helpful. But we prefer to use muscle relaxant, but again, by sort of the textbook answer would be that you don't necessarily need muscle relaxant. You just want to make sure that patient does not move or cough during the case, because again, we have a gigantic metal, uh, not relatively gigantic metal barrel inside the mouth going into the, um, uh, in, in your mouth going into the, the through the vocal cords. Uh, the question number five asks, how can you choose the correct size of barrel for each patient? It's a good question. Uh, uh, well, so um, I, I don't think we do a lot of, of so there's there's two different factors. One is the, the, the diameter and the other is the length. So there's two different lengths that I think most places are probably using one of two different kinds of rigid scopes um, or manufacturers. I, probably the most commonly used in the U.S. right now is Ifer Dumont or um, Lymol Medical. Um, I think Lyme was recently discontinued or is in the process of, of, of phasing out, but um, they have a longer one with side ports that's bronchial and a shorter one that's tracheal um, for most of the diameters that, that are available. Um, and the diameters go to, I think, seven and a half is the small, I don't think it's seven and a half, to 13.2 millimeters outer diameter. And then Carl Storrs makes a rigid bronchoscope that is, goes to 14 millimeters. Um, for the overwhelming majority of our cases, we start off with a with a 13.2 millimeter barrel. Um, if you know today we I, we had had a case where we did that where we were putting a stent in a, a silicone stent in, and we actually took it out and put in a size down, which was 12 millimeters. But most adult tracheas will accommodate um, a barrel that's that size. Um, and and sort of putting it into perspective, I, I don't know the exact number, but you're you're not far off from what you would be for a double lumen tube intubation. I don't I don't know the exact diameter, but um, you know it's it's a it, you're, it, it looks it looks bigger and it sounds worse, but but you're you know anesthesia our anesthesia colleagues are putting things of similar diameter into the trachea. So I think that you know starting off at that size is probably reasonable. Um, and there's usually still some wiggle room in the in the central airways. Yeah, I think your most common debate is going to be whether you go with the largest barrel that's available, which is usually like what Dr. Shell said, between 13.2 or, you know, 14 millimeter versus the 12 millimeter barrel. And the times that we, we may elect to go with a, the smaller barrel of 12 millimeter is if we have, you know, the, the size, you know, in terms of the height of the, the stature of the patient. Um, and then if we anticipate um, that we do not have to use a larger barrel for different reasons, then we may go into the 12 millimeter. But yeah, in our practice, we if we think that otherwise we're on the clear and okay, we will go with the 13.2. Um, Another benefit of using a larger barrel or the largest barrel that you think is, is sustainable or, or feasible in that patient is that you run less risk of injuring uh, your flexible scope if you are using a reusable scope. Um, in our practice, we have started to use single-use scopes almost exclusively for our rigid bronchoscopies. Um, and uh, um, whether or not it, you know, it, it doesn't matter as much if there is potential injury to the, to the tool, but, but one of the things that can happen is that you have, you have you know, a therapeutic size scope in, in the rigid barrel and you put you know, a big deployment catheter for a stent or forceps down, or you even, drag it on the on the on the beveled edge of the rigid you can have injury to the scope um and and so you know scope we didn't talk about it here but scope flexible scope safety um is an important consideration in rigid bronchoscopy and and we found that the you know the the the, the developments in single use scopes have actually helped us to do these procedures without uh, damaging our supply of of stents of i'm sorry of scopes um which i am have been very guilty on many occasions we can piggyback on that. I think the other question that came in and we, is uh, you mentioned they use a flexible uh, bronchoscope and other tools through the rigid bronchoscope. What size flexible bronchoscope do you use? Variable for what we're doing. I think usually we start with currently um, we will use the, the 
the, the newest um, uh, uh, AMBU um, uh, therapeutic flexible scope or an Olympus TH190 scope. Um, one of our colleagues trained at Henry Ford and they used an XT160 scope for all of their cases because it has a 3.2 millimeter working channel, so more suction power. Um, if it's a smaller barrel or a smaller lesion, sometimes you know we'll usually have a, a smaller scope on hand um, if we need to explore something distally or, or we really can't get through something, or we need to put you know piggyback with with something else bulky in the rigid scope. Um, so, what clinical indications suggest laser versus APC treatment? Um, that's a good question. So, so um, in general, I use so, so the two of the one of the big key differences with APC and laser is depth of penetration in terms of safety. So APC is is a very uh, shallow penetrating modality. Laser can penetrate a lot deeper depending on what kind of laser you're using and the settings that you're using. Um, in general, I use laser more for and 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 uh, APC is really much more of a coagulative surface coating modality, and so I do, is less suited to. Um, or really not suited to rapid debulking of larger lesions or not really to debulking at all. Um, I tend to use APC a lot for hemostasis um, and I use laser, uh, we have a Holmium YAG laser, which um, I think June and I use a lot more for um, tumor debulking. And, and then, yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And then there are, there are even when you, I mean, we didn't go more into it, but in terms of laser, there are different types, like so in the Holmium laser and the YAG laser. So and then you know CO2 lasers. So different lasers have a different powers and cut indications to among lasers themselves. So, uh, but what Dr. Schaller said is absolutely correct in terms of APC. I would almost exclu exclusively think of it as a hemostasis slash uh, very minimal to do with tumor debulking part. Um, but the laser we would use more often for tumor debulking here, as well as. Um, sometimes you would consider, you, you know, again, depending on the laser type, uh, cutting the stricture of the lesion as well. Um, but, you know, with the depth of penetration, we make sure that you're not cutting too deep that you're not supposed to. Um, the question eight goes, are we able to build separately when performing rigid bronchoscopy? If yes, then what CPT code? Great question. Unfortunately, our society have decided that there is no separability for rigid bronchoscopy. So, all our, there is no separate CPT code for rigid bronchoscopy by itself, whether for intubation part or added with anything else. So if you do and um, have any, if you do uh, intubation with rigid, rigid bronchoscopy, for example, and just do a, for whatever reason, patient's airway look pristine and great, and you just decided to do BAL for concern for infection, you will still use your regular BAL CPT code that you will use for flexible bronchoscopy 31624 and you know, nothing else additional. That's it. It's a great question to end on because I think it, it really stresses the fact that rigid bronchoscopy is something that you do because you think it's best for the patient and because it, you know, you, you enjoy what you do and you enjoy doing it. Um, there is uh, no extra reimbursement for it. Um, it is it is sometimes higher stress. Um, but there's, but on the, you know, on the tail end, it, it doesn't, it doesn't change what happens at the end of the case, but hopefully changes what happens to the patient for the better. Um, thank you so much again for having us and, and for the opportunity to, to, to uh, present here and to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you both Dr. Chang and Dr. Shaler for presenting. It was a wonderful informative lecture. Thank you everyone for joining tonight's webinar and thank you again to AMBU for sponsoring it. We will see you all at more SAB webinars. Have a good evening.